interdependence and global warming. We welcome you all here this morning. We all remember the tragic consequences of Hurricane Katrina, the breach levees, water-filled streets, and families seeking shelter in the Superdome. While many individuals courageously responded to this disaster, government leadership failed the people of New Orleans when they needed help the most. Katrina foreshadows the consequences of climate change if we do not make the necessary preparations. Since then, scientists have shown that the warming of our own climate system from emissions of heat-trapping gases from our tailpipes and smokestacks is unequivocal. We face not only an increasing number of strong storms, but also many permanent alter alterations that will affect people throughout the country. Coastal cities like Boston will be at risk of inundation from sea level rise, which is accelerating as our oceans warm and our polar uh, ice caps melt. Alaskan villages are finding the land they call home literally melting out from underneath them as the permafrost thaws. In the west, our shrinking mountain snowpack strains our water resource system. Throughout this country, our farms are threatened by rising temperatures, water scarcity, and pests. For a projected 2.2 degree Fahrenheit rise in temperatures over the next 30 years, we can expect significant declines in the crops that make up the base of our food system. The past is no longer a predictor of the future. <clears throat> we need to develop our resilience in order to safeguard our health, our environment, our economy, and our national security. We need to develop a comprehensive strategy to adapt, conduct world-class climate research, and coordinate federal, state, and local action. Now, some will argue that we should not address the root of the problem and only address its symptoms, that we should not only adapt, uh, that we should only adapt to climate change and not address global warming pollution. We cannot just address the symptoms. When people, when someone has a heart attack, the doctor prescribes medication to help prevent another attack and puts the patient on a low-fat diet to improve long-term health. Our country experienced a heart attack in New Orleans, and we must now develop both the institutional medication to manage the impacts of warming and also shift society to a low-carbon energy regimen for a healthy climate. Just as we cannot medicate our way out of a heart problem, we cannot adapt our way out of global warming. We have taken the first steps to cut uh, carbon pollution and build resilience to global warming <coughs> impacts. Earlier this year, the House passed the Waxman-Markey American Clean Energy and Security Act, which will set us on a pollution-cutting path and at the same time create millions of new jobs, making America the global leader of the clean energy economy. The Act will also create a, a national climate service that will provide decision makers with the very best climate information and help federal agencies and states adapt to the dangerous consequences of climate change. In a new report that I requested, the Government Accountability Office assesses the current steps our country is taking to address the impacts of global warming. They find that federal efforts thus far have been largely ad hoc. To effectively address the impacts, we need a strategic plan that sets our priorities, improves the information available to decision makers, and clarifies the roles and responsibilities of federal, state, and local governments. I look forward to the testimony of our witnesses and hearing uh, from them how Congress can help build our resilience to global warming. Uh, now I would like to recognize the ranking member of the uh, committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, adaptation is an important but overlooked facet of the global warming debate. That is probably why the GAO has concluded that federal, state, and local governments need better coordination on climate change adaptation strategies. It is a popular misconception that there is scientific consensus about the future impacts of global warming. <clears throat> there is little agreement in the scientific community about the, what the specific effects of climate change will be. That is why a strategy that focuses on adaptation and not taxes makes more sense. Congressional Democrats believe a cap-and-tax plan will cure global warming, but there is little reason to believe that that is true. Unless China and India make similar emission cuts, there won't be any reduction in global temperatures. Cap and tax may not have much impact on global temperatures, but it will have a big impact on the American economy. The Waxman-Markey cap and tax bill calls for an 83 percent cut in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, 
but a study by the National Association of Manufacturers and the American Council for Capital Formation shows that by 2030, the economy will already feel the pressure. Come 2030, cap and tax will have shaved as much as 2.4 percent or $571 billion off the U.S. gross domestic product. That's nearly as much as the government spent on Social Security last year. Cumulative GDP loss during the coming decades would be enormous, with projections of more than $3 billion in lost economic output. This isn't just a problem for business and industry, as the government will also be shortchanged. In 2030 alone, federal and state governments would see nearly $170 billion less in revenue. That's money that would be more wisely spent on adaptation. The GAO report shows that local and state government managers are finding it hard to fit global warming adaptation into their budgets, as more pressing concerns over jobs, infrastructure, security, and other issues are taking precedent as they should. By enacting cap and tax and reducing economic growth, Congress risks cutting the revenues that state and local governments will eventually need to fund climate adaptation projects. Proponents of the legislation argue that the bill will raise new tax revenues that can be used for adaptation. I would rather not reduce growth in the first place. The written testimony of one of today's witnesses emphasizes the importance of resilience to climate variability, regardless of the cause. Dr. Kenneth Green, a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, will submit testimony that highlights many important decisions for policymakers, such as faulty wisdom behind rapid development in areas prone to natural disaster, the need for investment in new climate technology, and the benefits market pricing could bring to adaptation preparation. I welcome his perspectives of part of today's record and yield back the balance of my time. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member uh, Sensenbrenner. And uh, I share the Ranking Member's concern about uh, development in areas that are prone to natural disasters. I uh, also congratulate him on getting the word tax in a record number of times in his opening statement. And uh, I think that this is a very important hearing uh, and look forward to our witnesses' uh, testimony. Uh, climate change adaptation has been a serious concern of mine for many years. My district is bis bisected by the Hudson River, one of America's natural treasures, which is tidal all the way to Troy, New York, north of Albany. <coughs> Along each side of the river, uh, nearly at the water level, runs two rail lines on the west side, a CSX uh, freight line, on the east side, the Amtrak and Metro North passenger lines. Sea level rise will imperil these lines, uh, which will be incredibly expensive to, uh, to move or to replace, as will uh, the other infrastructure uh, that we have counted on for years, which are threatened along our coasts. Um, many of the Riverside communities uh, in uh, the counties I represent and other Hudson Valley counties have spent a fortune on urban uh, renewal and revitalizing their waterfronts with boardwalks and restaurants and shops that are just barely above the level of the Hudson as it is today. And as a tidal uh, estuary, uh, obviously, if the sea level rises, that these um, beautiful new additions to our waterfronts will be uh, possibly underwater, not to mention Hilton Head, uh, Cape Hatteras, Key West, and other places that some of us like to uh, at least think about going to. Um, Dutchess County, my home county, has the third highest number of new cases of Lyme disease of any county in the country. There has been serious uh, uh, speculation that the spread of these diseases like Lyme and West Nile virus uh, are linked to changes in temperature and the increasing range of the insects that carry those diseases. Um, I will submit the rest of my statement to the record and, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentleman very much. Uh, now um, we are going to turn to our first witness, Mr. John Stevenson, who is the Director of Natural Resources and Environmental Issues for the U.S. Government Accountability Office. Uh, he uh, has testified uh, many times before Congress, uh, and he always produces uh, excellent work. So we thank you, sir. Welcome back. Whenever you're ready, please thank begin. You. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Sensenbrenner, Mr. Hall. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss our report on climate change adaptation and the role of the federal government. 
The world's leading scientists predict that increased concentrations of greenhouse gases could, among other things, threaten coastal areas with rising sea levels, alter agricultural productivity, and increase the intensity and frequency of tropical forms, uh, storms and floods. In recent years, climate change adaptation has begun to receive more attention because the greenhouse gases already in the atmosphere are expected to continue altering the climate system in the future, regardless of efforts to control emissions. However, individuals and institutions whose futures will be affected by climate change are at present unprepared both conceptually and practically for meeting the challenges it presents. Our report for this committee, which is being publicly released today, addresses three issues. One, what actions federal, state, and local interna uh, and international authorities are currently taking to adapt to climate change. The challenges that federal, state, and local officials face in their efforts to adapt and three actions that Congress and federal agencies could take to help address these challenges. In summary, we found that many federal agencies have begun to take action, but that these actions are largely ad hoc and fall into categories such as information for decision making and federal land and natural resource management, among others. There is currently no coordinated or overarching national approach to adaptation, but certain federal entities have started to fill this gap. The President's Council on Environmental Quality is leading a new initiative to coordinate the federal response to climate change in conjunction with the Office of Science and Technology Policy, NOAA and other agencies. Similarly, the U.S. Global Change Research Program, which coordinates and integrates federal research on climate change, has developed a series of building blocks that outline options for future climate change work, including science to inform adaptation. While most government authorities have not yet begun to adapt to climate change, there are some shining examples at the state and local level where planning has begun in earnest. We visited three such locales, New York City, King County, Washington, and the state of Maryland, where government officials are making good progress. Our analysis of these sites suggests key factors that have led these governments to act. First, natural disasters such as floods, heat waves, droughts, or hurricanes raise public awareness of the cost of potential climate change impacts. Second, leaders in all three sites use legislation, executive orders, local ordinance, or action plans to focus attention and resources on climate change adaptation. Third, each of these governments had access to relevant site-specific information through partnerships with local universities and other entities that provided a basis for planning efforts. Based on our site visits and the results of a survey we sent to over 270 federal, state, and local officials, the challenges faced by adaptation planners fall into three categories. First, attention and available resources are focused on more immediate needs, making it difficult for adaptation efforts to compete for limited funds. Second, insufficient site-specific data, such as local projections of expected changes, makes it hard to predict the impacts of climate change and thus hard for local officials to justify spending resources now for benefits that may be de derived in the distant future. Third, adaptation efforts are constrained by a lack of clearly defined roles and responsibilities for federal, state, and local agencies. Finally, our survey respondents suggested specific federal actions that are needed to help overcome these challenges. First, training and education efforts are needed to increase awareness among government officials and the public about the impacts of climate change and available adaptation strategies. Second, assistance is needed to interpret and develop site-specific information to help officials understand the impacts of climate change at a scale that would enable them to develop response plans. And third, there is a need to clarify roles and responsibilities across federal agencies and with state and local governments. Our work suggests that a more coordinated federal response would demonstrate a federal commitment to adaptation. To that end, our report recommends the development of a national strategic plan that will guide the nation's efforts to adapt to cha a changing climate, one that defines priorities, clarifies roles and responsibilities, facil facilitates the exchange of information, identifies resource needs, and builds on existing adaptation planning efforts. Mr. Chairman, that concludes the summary of my statement. I will be happy to answer questions at the appropriate time. Thank you, sir, very much. Uh, <clears throat> at this time, I would like to ask unanimous consent to include in the record a letter from Nancy Sutley, who is the Chair of the Council on Environmental Quality, in which she agrees with the recommendations of the GAO report.
and lays out some of the steps they have already initiated to coordinate federal adaptation efforts. Without objection, it will be included in the record. Our next witness is Mr. Eric Schwab, who is the Deputy Secretary of the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. Uh, he is uh, going to uh, help us to understand what uh, Maryland is doing, what their ongoing work is in dealing with these issues. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. It is a pleasure to be with you here today to share some perspectives regarding Maryland's success in planning for climate change, as well as our ideas with respect to how we might improve the federal presence and coordination of those activities. Uh, I would also like to mention how pleased we were to work with um, the GAO in the development of their report and to be featured um, as one of the local, uh, as one of the states, the state, uh, working on this issue. Maryland has, in fact, already recognized that the forces of climate change, um, particularly with respect to rising sea levels, have been set in motion um, irreversibly to a large degree. And that in addition to enhanced focus on mitigation, we must take steps now to plan for implications of climate change um, as they affect us socially, economically, and environmentally. We must fully integrate climate change adaptation planning into many existing state programs and practices. Uh, the same, of course, can be done at the federal level. We cannot continue to plan and implement programs as if our environment was static from a climate perspective. From efforts to restore Chesapeake Bay, conserve forests, and enhance wildlife habitats um, to local land use decisions, every one of our actions must be taken with our best under understanding of the realities of climate change at the forefront. This is of particular interest to Maryland. Chesapeake Bay is ranked the third most vulnerable region in the nation to impact of sea level rise. Uh, this has already been apparent um, in the loss of land along the Atlantic coast and the bay shoreline over the last hundred years. And due to climate change, we expect an acceleration of sea level rise at least twice as fast as that which occurred during the 20th century, uh, resulting in potentially 2.7 to 3.4 feet of sea level rise by the year 2100. Such a rise will cause increased vulnerability to storm events, more frequent and severe coastal flooding, inundation of low-lying lands, submergence of tidal marshes, more shore erosion, and saltwater intrusion of freshwater wells. Uh, Maryland is, of course, equally concerned with the other consequences of changing climate. The state's agriculture industry, our forest resources, fisheries, freshwater supply, and other aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems, and in addition to that, human health, will all be impacted by increasing temperature and changes in precipitation patterns. Uh, all of these caused Maryland to initiate action. In April of 2007, Governor O'Malley signed an executive order establishing the Maryland Climate Change Commission. A year after its formation, the commission released Maryland's climate action plan, setting forth a course of action to stem not only the drivers of climate change, but also for how to adapt to those inevitable consequences already set in motion. Maryland remains one of the few states that have included an adaptation component in state-level climate change action planning. Let me just highlight a few elements of our plan that have already been undertaken. Um, we have made significant progress in acquiring new technology to look at historic shoreline change data and utilize this change data to undertake state-of-the-art sea level rise mapping and research. Um, we have developed an imp and, and enacted a Living Shoreline Protection Act and a, amendments to our Chesapeake and Coastal Bays Critical Area Act, um, which will increase shoreline resiliency and limit building in the most vulnerable areas. Sea level rise technical planning guide guidance was crafted for three of our most vulnerable coastal counties. Uh, in April of 2009, with the help of uh, our uh, coastal zone program, we and we hosted the Coast Smart event, an interactive event to discuss and evaluate local planning strategies for communities to, to improve their ability to adapt um, to sea level rise. Our de transportation department is assessing impacts related to um, highway system planning, and our wildlife division is assessing climate change vul vulnerability as it, re as it relates to um, specific species of concern. Um, we have already kicked off phase two 
of development of our strategies, which will be focused on um, identifying further impacts in six issue-based areas, including water resources, agriculture, aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems, forestry, agriculture, human health, and transportation and land use. We would like to offer just a couple of perspectives with respect to what the Federal Government, we think in particular, can do. There is much more detail of this in my written testimony. Uh, first, the Nation needs a clear national strategy. This strategy should provide an integrated approach to these challenges. Many programs undertaken in partnership um, by the State at the Federal level uh, would benefit substantially by building in climate change uh, assessments into program implementation. Secondly, the, the key role of the states in climate change adaptation planning must be clearly integrated into a national program. And finally, that action at the federal level to provide dedicated funding for adaptation is imperative to protect communities, natural resources, and the national interest from the impacts of climate change. Uh, there are additional um, suggestions in Great. my testimony, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate again the opportunity to be here okay. um, to Thank speak you, with sir. you. I appreciate it. Uh, our next uh, witness is Mr. Stephen uh, Seidel. He is the Vice President for Policy Analysis at the Pew Center uh, on Global Climate Change. We welcome you, sir. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, I am delighted to be here today and pleased that you have focused this hearing on what we need to do to adapt to climate change. Adapting to climate change is clearly necessary, but should not in any way detract from efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Such reductions are the first and best line of defense against the risks of climate change. Why then should we also be focusing on adaptation? Because the science community has made it clear that our climate has already begun to change. We have experienced warmer temperatures, more extreme weather events, and sea level rise. Even with our best efforts to reduce future emissions, substantial amounts of climate change are unavoidable. Confronted with that reality, it no longer makes sense to assume that future climate will be the same as that of the past. We should be making every effort to adapt to these unavoidable changes in climate as we redouble our efforts to reduce future greenhouse gas emissions. The title of a recent UN report aptly captures what we need to do. Avoid the unmanageable and manage the unavoidable. My written testimony provides some concrete examples of how the Federal Government can and must lead this effort to build greater resiliency into our economy. I want to focus on three ways this can be accomplished. First, adaptation must be mainstreamed across all relevant Federal programs. As the nation's largest landholder and the Federal Government owns about 29 percent of our nation's lands, many Federal assets are at risk from changes in climate. DOD alone has thousands of facilities um, located in coastal areas. Throughout our government and its programs, climate change impacts will be pervasive. To begin addressing the Federal role in adaptation, we recommend that all relevant Federal agencies undertake a strategic plan. This plan should identify an agency's programs, regulations, and facilities that are affected by climate change, identify barriers to making these more climate resilient, and develop a plan of action and priorities for implementation. Our work on adaptation suggests that this strategic planning process can most effectively be coordinated through the Council on Environmental Quality, and we are encouraged that they have recently taken steps down this path by creating an interagency <coughs> working group. We would recommend agency strategies um, as a first step, followed by sector plans to address critical cross-cutting issues and to assure coordination among agencies. Once an initial round of agency and sector plans have been completed, we would then recommend a national strategy that was informed by these efforts and that sets priorities and goals. As part of mainstreaming adaptation, we also recommend that CEQ amend its existing regulations to clarify that climate change impacts and possible adaptation measures should be evaluated for all major Federal actions. Our second recommendation is the creation through legislation of a national climate change adaptation program. 
This would be a sister program to the two existing interagency climate change programs, the Global Change Research Program and the Climate Change Technology Program. Both have been established through legislation. The National Climate Change Adaptation Program could be created as an interagency program along the lines of GCRP, uh, but its goal would be to facilitate development of high-level policy direction, coordinate federal activities, and ensure proper integration across agencies. Our third suggestion relates to the need for the federal government to play a critical role in providing technical support to help state and local governments and the private sector to meet their adaptation challenges. Before any entity can respond to climate change, they first need information on what those changes are likely to be. We suggest the creation of a National Climate Service to fill this function and recommend that NOAA lead this effort. But we also recommend that other federal agencies have important roles to play as sector leads for the purpose of effectively engaging state and local stakeholders. Finally, we're pleased that the House bill includes a substantial section on adaptation. We believe that what was in the bill can be improved, though, in three ways. First, by requiring all federal agencies to undertake comprehensive adaptation plans, rather than by limiting the scope of those plans to natural resources and public health issues, as is currently in the bill. It's critically important that other agencies, like the Department of Transportation, the Department of Energy, Department of Defense, also undertake strategic plans. Second, while the bill creates a national adaptation program, it locates it within the Global Change Research Program and focuses its activities on research. We believe that as currently drafted and passed by the House, it places too great an emphasis on the research side and shortchanges the critical needs to mainstream adaptation across all federal programs. And finally, we believe the bill could clarify the structure of a national climate service and make it more focused on the needs of the users uh, by identifying a critical role for other agencies to play. Be glad to answer questions. Thank you. At the appropriate time. Thank you, Mr. Seidel, very much. And our final witness is Dr. Kenneth Green, who is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise uh, Institute. Uh, we welcome you, uh, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Chairman Markey, <clears throat> Mr. Spencer Brenner, members of the committee. Uh, thank you for inviting me to testify today on this important topic. Along with these remarks, I've submitted for the record a policy study that I recently completed entitled Climate Change, the Resilience Option. My testimony here today represents my personal views and should not be construed as the official position of any other institution or people. <clears throat> Before I get into the meat of my remarks, I'd like to start with my three Bs, the background biases and beliefs. As the background, I'm a biologist and environmental scientist by training, an economist by exposure, and a policy analyst by vocation. I've been uh, doing environmental policy analysts for 15 years now in the U.S. and Canada. My bias is for solving environmental problems wherever possible with more instruments that m maximize freedom, opportunity, enterprise, and personal responsibility. Thus, I strongly favor true market-based remedies for environmental problems over command and control regulation. I will observe here, with no offense intended, that cap and trade is not a true market-based instrument, uh, as the government sets a limit on emissions rather than having the limit quantity or price set by uh, voluntary consumers in a free marketplace. Finally, my scientific beliefs are based on reading the literature as well as the IPCC climate re science reports. And while I do believe greenhouse gases retain heat in the atmosphere, or we would not have a habitable planet, uh, the heat retention ability of additional anthropogenic gases, I believe, is modest. Uh, I certainly do not believe in predictive modeling, and anyone who has looked at their 401k lately should take predictive models with a huge grain of salt. That being said, I do believe climate science has taught us something very important, which is We've learned the Earth's climate system is not the placid thing we had originally thought it was. It is prone to sharp shifts in temperature that can last between years to two decades. Uh, so we should be changing the way we do things with regard to, to responding to our climate. How best can we ensure resilience? First, I believe we should shift our focus from mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions toward an adaptation agenda. We don't, at present, have the technologies needed to significantly curb greenhouse gas emissions without causing major economic disruption and without preventing the developing countries from developing, lifting their, their billions out of poverty and squalor. Uh, even if we were to shut the United States and the EU off, the emissions from China and India would undo any environmental benefit in a matter of years. Uh, all that jacking up energy prices will do is deprive us of economic productivity, which is the ultimate wellspring of our resilience and well-being. Second, I believe we should stop making things worse. 
That is, we should remove the misguided incentives that have people living in climatically fragile areas, such as the water's edge, drought-prone locations, flood-prone uh, locations, and so on. Currently, our federal and state governments exacerbate this risk-taking by acting as the insurer of last resort. When people who live at the water's edge or in a floodplain are hit by storms and floods, governments intervene not only to rescue them, but often to allow them to build right back where they were so that they can be rescued again. We're doing this in New Orleans, and we'll probably do this in California, putting people right back in the areas they were burned out of this year. As um, Charles Perot observes in his book, Our Next Catastrophe, state-mandated pools have been established to serve as a market of last resort for those unable to get insurance, but the premiums are low, and thus those have the perverse effect of subsidizing people who choose to live in risky areas, imposing excessive costs on people living elsewhere. Programs that subsidize climatic risk taking should be phased out as quickly as possible in favor of fully priced insurance regimes. Rebuilding after disasters in climatically fragile areas should be discouraged. Encur eliminating risk subsidies would show people some of the true cost of living in climatically risky areas and would over time lead them to move to climatically safer places where they can afford to insure their property and safety. Third, we must look to our infrastructure. Another government action that leads people to live in harm's way is the failure to build and price infrastructure so that it is sustainable and resilient to change. Governments build highways, but generally without pricing mechanisms. Thus, no revenue stream is created to allow for the highway to be elevated or levees built if local flooding becomes a problem. There's also no price signal relayed to the users of the highway that reflect the climatic risk that their transportation choices face. The same is true of freshwater infrastructure, wastewater infrastructure, electricity, and other infrastructure. Politicians enjoy cutting ribbons on new free infrastructure. They're less prone toward having the cost of that infrastructure show up in terms of tolls or user fees. Uh, establishing marketing, market pricing of infrastructure would quickly steer people away from fragile areas, dramatically reducing the costs of dealing with climate variability. For example, consider our electricity supply. As long as governments distort the prices consumers pay for energy with subsidies, fuel mandates, renewable power mandates, and the like, um, where am I? electricity markets cannot effectively adapt to changing climate conditions. If the markets were deregulated and full costs passed along, price signals would be created for electricity providers to expand or reduce capacity in areas prone to heat waves or cold snaps, uh, and would also encourage consumers to adopt more efficient ways of using electricity. Finally, I would suggest we trust in resilience but tie up our camel. In the event that climate change does tend toward higher estimates put out by the United Nations and other groups, it's reasonable to consider insurance options that might help deal with such changes, including government R&D into geoengineering research and the removal of greenhouse gases directly from the atmosphere. Uh, climate variability poses a risk to our population, and we should take steps to face that. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I look forward to your questions. If we ever need a speed reader, we're bringing you back. Okay, you you uh, you got a seven-minute statement. In well, when you have one of those eight, when you have one of those eight hundred-page bills. Like <laughs> so, uh, fifteen hundred pages. Thank you. Um, the um, uh, uh, the chair uh, recognizes the gentleman from uh, New York, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you uh, to all of our witnesses. Uh, I gather there's some. Uh, rough consensus that there needs to be a federal strategy for dealing with the effects of climate change. And uh, several of you have talked about the need for a strategy to coordinate federal efforts uh, with government-wide strategic planning or perhaps a working group uh, akin to or under the auspices of the Council on Environmental Quality. Uh, in my uh, relatively brief time here in Congress, I have I've seen problems that have been studied to death or seem to have been uh, shelves and shelves of reports from commissions and blue ribbon panels, studies upon studies, studies of studies uh, that are gathering dust uh, in offices around the Capitol uh, with no enforcement mechanisms uh, in place. Uh, working groups rarely have a parent agency that is going to enforce implementation once the consensus, assuming that consensus is reached. So I, my first question is uh, to to each of you is uh, what are your recommendations for making sure that whatever strategy is developed at the federal level to coordinate these resources and efforts of the federal government will be effectively implement, implemented and enforced? And uh, what, what can we in Congress do to assist in that effort? I will start out. Um, Thank you. We think that is part of the reason that there needs to be an overarching strategy to decide where best to put that. We agree that it, it may not work within an existing agency. Um, uh, many agencies can f fulfill uh, viable functions as part of that overarching strategy. Uh, 
However, we haven't looked at the need, for example, for an independent climate program office or an independent agency or anything like that. Uh, but I, I agree with your concern that if, if there isn't a central authority to um, guide this and to enforce this, um, it may not work. Um, if, if I may just add yes, to that, uh, and I think I've had the misfortune of writing one or two of those reports that <laughs> sat on a shelf. Uh, I, what we've seen in, in the case studies that we looked at was executive leadership is really critical. So when you have Governor Schwarzenegger, when you have Mayor Bloomberg, uh, when you have Governor O'Malley saying, you know, through executive order, this will be done, and really charging the political leadership of those organizations to carry forward, uh, it's gone a long way to ensuring uh, follow-up action. But I wouldn't stop there, and, and that's in part why we also recommend uh, changes to regulations requiring uh, adaptation be con taken into consideration in all major federal actions through the NEPA EIS process. Um, I, I noticed in, uh, in uh, Mr. Schraub's testimony uh, that uh, Maryland uh, has already lost uh, a number of islands in the Chesapeake uh, that used to be uh, islands and now are underwater. And, um, you know, we have seen uh, the changes in acidification of the ocean due to absorption of uh, carbon dioxide and so on. I, I'm, I'm just curious, uh, Dr. Green, whether uh, you can tell me of any market uh, forces uh, so far that you're aware of that have come into play to stop those kinds of things from happening. Well, thank you very much. Um, I agree the, the acidification of the ocean is a potentially troubling uh, side effect of greenhouse gas emissions. It remains to be seen exactly how troubling in the past periods when uh, shelled animals actually ruled the oceans, CO2 levels were considerably higher than they are today. So the idea that we will not have shelled animals because CO2 levels increase the acidification of the ocean uh, has yet to be demonstrated. Um, will market mechanisms fix that? Um, the acidification question? Probably not. The localization or the, the adjacency to uh, water areas, yes, you could move people away from areas that are very highly prone to flooding. Um, as my, geo, um, as my uh, hydrology teacher used to tell us, you know why they call them floodplains, don't you? Because they flood. And so people should not be living in them. Uh, right. And to the extent that we subsidize their living there, we should cease doing so. I, I'm uh, <clears throat> in agreement. The question is how to get from here to there. For instance, uh, people living on the barrier islands uh, any, anywhere along the East Coast or the Gulf Coast. Uh, but to change the subject slightly, um, in the Hudson River, the salt wedge at high tide is drawn up uh, to just south of the Chelsea pumping station, which is just south of Poughkeepsie. That's the backup water intake for New York City's drinking water in case the reservoirs fail or are sabotaged, and, um, or in case the aqueduct uh, fails. Uh, there's already uh, concern that uh, sea level rise is um, uh, projected, even just from the uh, greenhouse gases that have already been emitted, uh, may be sufficient to push that salt wedge up uh, high enough to require desalinization of the uh, water supply uh, to New York City if they need to rely on the Chelsea pumping station. Now, that's another um, question where, you know, I, I have yet to see a market uh, force or hear one described to, that would uh, either uh, prevent that from happening by uh, restraining the emissions uh, that seem to be Causing it, according to many scientists, or or that would uh, that would solve uh, the problem. I think it's going to take, in my opinion, a governmental uh, action or actions, uh, either to to mitigate or to uh, try to restrain uh, the scenario. And with that question, I'll yield back. A brief answer would be sure. It could be a comment. Yeah. <laughs> it may be a comment, but if if I may respond, um, yeah, just. Classic markets work when all the costs and benefits are taken into consideration. When there are ex externalities, when external costs are not taken into consideration, markets don't work. And that's when government needs to step in um, and make those markets work more effectively. I Mr. think that's the classic case that you're describing. Mr. Green? 
Um, yes, in fact, I, I agree with um, my colleague here. The right thing to do if you have an externality is to internalize the externality. There are indeed economic approaches that would solve the problem, such as instead of relying only on that water as your backup, there could be other backup systems established. Through the full cost pricing of water, people could use much less water, putting less strain on your existing water infrastructure. There are any number of things you could do to make your water system more resilient to change. If I believed we could actually take control of the global climate and push sea levels in whichever way we directed without going economically into complete uh, disruption, I wouldn't have a problem with it. But I don't believe we have the technology to take over control of the global climate, and therefore we have to adapt. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognized the gentleman from Wisconsin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think we all know that uh, the computerized projections on what's going to happen to the climate uh, uh, can result in widely varying results 10, 15, 20, 50 years out if there is almost an infinitesimal change in the data which is put into the computer. Now, since 2000, according to Dr. Green's paper, which I believe to be scientifically uh, valid, it has determined that the rate of our planet's warming has flattened out or begun to decline. And as a result, what was being talked about at the time of Kyoto, before this flattening out of, uh, of, the, of the temperatures and or slight declining of the temperatures, uh, will probably be significantly different uh, by 2020, 2030, and definitely by 2050. When we're talking about resiliency and adaptation, uh, if the uh, premises upon which decisions are to be made are off and will result in the wide uh, variation in what the projections will be, how do we do it? And I'm going to start with you, Mr. Seidel. Um. Thank you, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Um, you know, basically, we are seeing this experiment unfold before our very eyes. We've seen temperatures rise. We've seen sea level rise. We've seen the loss of, of islands in Maryland. So you know, it's, we're not just basing this on projections of computer models. Um, the second point you raised <coughs> is about the recent changes, uh, the recent sort of flattening out of the temperature record since the year 2000. And, you know, every analysis I've seen expects that there will be, there's still natural variability in the climate system. Um, there will be years that are warmer, there will be years that are colder. And, you know, the last couple of years uh, have been relatively warm compared to the, the record. In fact, um, last year was the coldest year of this century, but the 10th warmest year, I believe, in the 150-year record. This decade, which you're referring to as climate has stabilized, will still be the warmest decade um, among the 150-year record. Well, using uh, the language of the left, uh, I think, Mr. Seidel, that answer it makes you a denier. Uh, because if you look at uh, uh, the trends, uh, there has been a at least flattening out of the warming trend or maybe a slight cooling trend since the year 2000. And I guess what I'm saying is that the inconvenient truth of two years ago might not be either inconvenient or truthful today uh, because of, of, of these types of changes. Now, what we're talking about here is an adaptation policy that is supposed to last for a while, and there will be certain economic and financial uh, commitments that will have to be made in order to implement the adaptation policy. Given the fact that uh, the projections of a decade ago that uh, the temperatures will continue to rise and maybe even increase, uh, how as uh, uh, policymakers, are we to be able to decide in a manner that we won't be embarrassed uh, later on by saying we were wrong and what uh, the prescription was to deal with this issue? In terms of adaptation itself, I think it's critical that the types of changes that we can make 
to our, our economic systems that are dependent on climate um, will create um, benefits. And those benefits are true whether um, there's rapid climate change, as the vast majority of scientists predict, or because of the climate variability, um, as uh, my but, colleague here but, would suggest. But, you know, with all due respect, what I'm saying is that, you know, you are saying we ought to adapt, but you, Mr. Seidel, aren't adapting to new figures. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Spear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Regardless of whether we believe climate change is real or not, it appears that the panelists agree that adaptation is a key component. So let's start there. Uh, Director Stevenson, in your GAO report, your third point was that basically of the respondents, 71 percent of them believed it was the national role to come up with adaptation policies. Um, could you explore that with us a little bit more? What, what are the states looking for? What are the counties and cities looking for? What kind of direction are they expecting to come from the federal government? Uh, I, think th I think the biggest single need is probably localized um, information. Um, everybody's read the IPCC and what they think is going to happen in general as a result of climate change. But there needs to be a body of research and scientists that can help people translate those into what it means to my local community. And irregardless if you believe whether sea level is going to rise two feet or eight feet, it's not an excuse for not planning an adaptation policy. For example, one of the case studies we looked at in King County, Washington, um, they're looking at the effects on a wastewater facility that's close to the Puget Sound. Um, if they ignored the fact that sea level may rise two feet and inundate some of the pumps associated with that wastewater facility, they would be negligent. So, and planning is not going to be static either. You have to, uh, uh, the adaptation plan is going to be a moving target as the science gets better and better, just like anything else. So but I think the localized information will be the starting point for local communities beginning to plan an adaptation program, but it has to be anchored in some sort of statistics on what will happen with uh, the rivers and the oceans and et cetera. So knowing how strapped localities are right now, are you suggesting that the federal government should offer grants to localities to do this evaluation? Um, we, we haven't looked at that specifically, but that's always uh, a good incentive, and I believe in, in the current House bill that is proposed to give states adaptation money. Uh, uh, nobody knows how many, how many revenues the, um, the sale of carbon is going to produce, but um, that would be a good use of the money, certainly, to anyone provide else to the have states for adaptation planning. Does anyone else have comments on, on that? In, in California, I, and in particularly in my district, there are some alarming statistics already and data that suggests San Francisco International Airport would be flooded. Um, many of my communities would have tens of thousands of people that would be um, no longer, would be homeless in effect. Um, I frankly don't think insurance is the answer, Mr. Green, uh, Dr. Green, excuse me, um, because I've seen all too well in California in terms of earthquake insurance that at a point um, the insurers no longer have enough money to respond to claims and the state in, in the case of Northridge was left holding the bag. So uh, I guess my question to all of you, and Dr. Green, you could comment as well, is I'm not a fan of, of more studies, as my um, colleague from New York has already stated. One of the things in California they're looking at is something called coastal armor, which I presume is, is levees. Um, why not take that kind of attack, where you don't have to study anymore? You can just, on the coastal regions in this country, just incentivize localities to build up these levees. Comment? Yes, Doctor. The, um, I also grew up in Los Angeles, by the way. <clears throat> I had the privilege of being there for the Silmar quake and the Northridge quake. So uh, I understand the, the fragility of that particular uh, part of the world. Um, it, with regard to whether insurance works, I mean, if you reach a point where you have people living in an area that cannot be privately insured, that is a de facto problem by itself. I mean, that shows you that the people are not willing to pay the full cost 
of living in the area based on its fragility or its, its particular pro tendencies toward disruption. But I agree with you, there's no reason why, and I, and I mentioned this in my, in my paper, there's no reason why you can't install coastal armor, why you can't build seawalls <clears throat> as well. My suggestion, though, is rather than make the mistakes of the past by having the state governments build them, those should be done in public-private partnerships and based on a utility where people pay a certain share of the protective aspect of that levy. And again, the price signal will determine whether or not people are really willing to live there and how, how they want to protect themselves or if they need to move inland a bit. And we are talking, let's not forget, sea level is not going to simply go up two feet tomorrow. We're talking over 100 years, assuming it continues to rise at the rate it has since the last ice age. That's a lot of time for people to be able to creep back and adapt and build. Uh, we built systems much more quickly than that. We built the entire national highway system in only 50 years. So uh, there's, there is time to adapt, and it's, it's worth the effort of thinking through how to do it sustainably. Thank you. Uh, I see my time has expired, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentlelady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenau. Thank you. Um, I, I cringe a little bit thinking about armoring uh, the seacoasts. I mean, you have a third of your uh, of uh, coastal areas in Southern California already armored, um, and we're watching what happens as we deflect <coughs> tidal action. We make it possible uh, impossible to renourish beaches. Uh, we accelerate erosion elsewhere, um, and uh, ultimately uh, we're ending up. Uh, I mean, it is a finger in the dike. Uh, so I, uh, I know that there are some communities that do this repeatedly with artificial beach construction, but it, um, it, it brings me to an area where I actually agree with uh, Dr. Green about uh, the federal government uh, subsidizing uh, people living in places where nature indicates that it's really not a good idea. Uh, I have been extraordinarily frustrated um, having spent seven years working on flood insurance reform, watching how hard it is to make that happen. Uh, our colleague, uh, the, the ranking uh, minority member, Mr. Sensenbrenner, was concerned about our not being embarrassed in the future. Well, putting aside for a moment uh, the scientific consensus about what is likely to be happening over 20 and 40 and 60 years, I think the likelihood of embarrassment is much greater if we don't act uh, than if we do. But it seems to me, for reasons that have, the panel has been touching on, uh, this is something we should be doing even if we didn't believe that climate change was uh, upon us, that sea levels were rising, that we were going to have more extreme weather events. We've already seen an increase in wildfires, in flooding, uh, in uh, storm events. Uh, insurance losses. And it would seem to me that, um, uh, that we uh, ought to listen to you and make our federal policies consistent with strengthening these partnerships. Uh, flood insurance reform, I think, would be one. Uh, the Coastal Barriers, uh, Coastal Barriers Protective Act, Co COBRA? Resources. Resources. Uh, I, since I've been here, people come in and they try and nibble away at it because they want uh, an, another area to be added. And there was a mapping error, or there was new evidence, or um, you know, basically this was one of the most profound environmental pieces of legislation of the Reagan administration, and something that we all ought to be able to get uh, behind and expand rather than um, than minimize. Um, I would just make an observation about market-driven solutions uh, that Dr. Green is interested in, which I am very interested in pursuing. But I think the, at core, our climate change legislation that a number of our colleagues here have been working on so heavily is a market-based solution. I mean, cap and trade injects uh, an opportunity to, to uh, create a market for carbon pollution and be able to make adjustments in a variety of markets uh, at, at home and around the world. I'm particularly interested, though, in some specific areas where we might be able to, uh, to do uh, a better job. Uh, Mr. Schwab, uh, you talked about what Maryland has done to try and protect development in sensitive areas. I come from a state that has a comprehensive plan that actually mandates that they be, um, that we're sensitive to uh, 
natural hazards. And uh, as our statewide land use planning has taken effect over the course of the last 20 years, we're actually seeing a reduction in uh, flood damage, for instance, at a time when we're seeing more of it nationally. Do you have a sense of what federal policies we ought to um, be implementing that could strengthen Maryland's ability and other states to be able to protect these vulnerable places? Thank you. Yeah, let me just first say, uh, generally, I think there are two levels of, uh, two ways that we need to coordinate. One is better horizontally uh, across the agencies. An example of that um, that I think has been very successful recently is in President Obama's executive order relating to coordination amongst federal agencies in implementing the Chesapeake Bay restoration program. And we have seen tremendous um, progress in a very short time as a result of that executive leadership in mandating horizontal coordination across the federal agencies. The other way is this, um, what I would term perhaps more, more vertically uh, oriented, and that is where there would be coordination, um, recognition and, implement, you know, and implementation of adaptation perspectives in the, uh, in the implementation of programs that the states uh, that the states enact in partnership with the federal government. And that ranges from, you know, that, that runs the gamut from, you know, highway planning and, and, uh, and, and resource deployment to things like wildlife habitat action planning and, uh, and, and, and forest conservation. And there are, 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 are a number of sort of vertical opportunities where coordination down from the federal agency with a specific implementation responsibility in, co in cooperation with the state um, can do a better job. I think both of those generally um, have, a, have, have a lot to offer. Um, there are some specific uh, recommendations that are included in my testimony. I'll, I'll give you know, the Coastal Zone Program um, has been an incredibly important force for us in allowing us to study and implement um, some of these adaptation strategies. And reauthorization of the Coastal Zone Act um, with a more explicit uh, climate adaptation responsibility and role is something um, in particular that we highlighted in our testimony. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for, uh, for being here. Uh, editorially, uh, in my real life, I'm a Methodist minister, and one of the least um, joyful parts of what I do is sitting by, the, uh, by beds when, as people are, are dying. And one of the strangest things um, is that in, in all the years I've been doing it, 30 years, I have never heard anyone say to me uh, as, as they're moving towards sunset, you know, I really regret having taken such good care of my body. I've never heard anybody say, you know, I'm embarrassed because I didn't smoke and I, you know, didn't get cancer. It's just so embarrassing, I don't know what to do. Um, and maybe in, some, in the future somebody will do it, but so far uh, I've never heard it. Um, the testimony of Mr. Stevenson uh, and Mr. Swap, if I understand it correctly, uh, both of you are, are, I think, suggesting that uh, we need this national uh, strategy, adaptation, whereas it, it, it seems uh, Mr. Seidel, that you are saying, uh, you're suggesting that we ought to, you know, begin in, in the, the, the departments uh, and develop the, 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 the strategy. Um, so there's, I think there's, there's a difference here. Um, I'm on the housing committee. HUD, for example, is, is, is essentially doing that, uh, but the impact won't be as great because uh, there, are, there are instances where HUD, the activities of the Department of HUD interact with the department, with, um, you know, uh, uh, HHS or uh, the Department of Justice. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to reconcile 
the, the, the differences. Can you help me, please? Yeah, I, I think it's a question of timing and staging. Um, I think we all agree there needs to be uh, a federal-wide program and strategy. But we thought, based on our discussions with um, experts and, and what we've seen done in the past, that the agencies need to take it on first. And I'd say the Department of Interior uh, is a great example of moving forward um, and looking through each of their program areas uh, and coming up with what needs to be done uh, to deal with the types of changes um, that uh, have been discussed this morning. Um, then that, we believe, feeds into um, a national strategy. Um, it's sort of the classic uh, bottom-up, top-down type of, but in the end, you sort of want to end up in the same place. If, if I could comment, um, I think what we've seen is there has been a lot of activity at the individual agency level with, with uh, climate change adaptation planning. Um, and a yes, matter of fact, six in, our, in, our re, in our report, we're going to appendicize a summary of all the 15 or so agencies that have undertaken this. But what we're seeing and what we mean by ad hoc is um, there's no ar overarching national strategy. Uh, as part of that development of that strategy, we would see um, what the government structures would look like to implement that. Interagency task forces don't often work for the same reasons you mentioned. Um, if it's not the Department of Labor's issue, they don't worry about it. So they're, they're of limited effectiveness. So we think that's part that needs to be studied um, in developing an overarching strategy is who's going to do what, so assigning roles and responsibilities, certainly to get the federal agencies coordinated, but also to look um, downwards at the state and local governments as well. Mr. Schwab. Thank you. We, we also don't believe, believe it's an either-or circumstance, and I think Mr. Seidel is exactly right. There are some sequencing uh, questions at play here. We have already seen some very important efforts come out of the federal agencies. The Corps of Engineers in July of this year issued a, a report on sea level change considerations for civil works projects. We've seen similar work um, in the Department of Interior with the, with the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, as was mentioned. And those things have been very important to us as a state. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, this, is, this may be more f philosophical. Uh, uh, but in a free society, do you think people have the, the right to do bad things to themselves? Um, anybody? May I? Uh, Dr. To, the, Dr. to themselves? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> generally speaking, yes, as long as they're not exporting the cost of their action to other people. I believe they have the right to do things that, you, that others may consider a bad trade-off. I have heard people express regrets for not having traveled more as they get later in their life, or not having experienced things such as skydiving and taking risks. So I do believe that that's the case. I would also just like to contribute also that what hasn't been mentioned here is the role that the military can play in uh, looking at adaptation responses. And I know they're very interested in this. I've spoken to, at military uh, forum before. Uh, where they need to plan for the adaptation of their bases, they need to plan for the adaptation of their structures, um, and they need to do that in conjunction with the other agencies, uh, as well as the, the discussion of the establishment of the north-south wilderness corridors and changing the way that we establish protected areas in the United States. Right now we do it by drawing circles on a map and putting someone's name on there as a park, which is not how the animals are going to need to respond if the climate changes and need to move north and south. So those are kind of changes we, that agencies can look at right away uh, agencies of the federal government can look at right away to increase our adaptivity, both ours and our ecosystems adaptiveness. Thank you. Great. Gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Uh, I want to express uh, a little concern about the subject we're talking about, which is uh, you know how we respond to this problem. And I have a little bit of concern that talking about the problem of climate change and ocean acidification in these terms could somehow siphon off energy for trying to stop the disease in the first place. Uh, you see a little bit tone of that. This book, uh, uh, Freakonomics, came out the other day, or Freakonomics 2, and the authors sort of said, well, you know, we don't have to stop CO2 going to the atmosphere. We'll just mitigate it somehow by putting a shield of sulfur dioxide. Now, in the book, they, I'm told they've grievously misstated these scientists' positions, who now are absolutely in open rebellion against the two authors who think they were grievously quoted wrong. But it shows this kind of 
siphoning off of energy if we start saying we'll just solve the problem by putting a big wall around us you know we'll just isolate ourselves from this problem and that's how we'll deal with it rather than really putting our energies into stopping co2 pollution uh, should that be a concern at all and if so how do we make sure that while we're thinking about how to prevent the or, or respond to the change that's already baked into the system doesn't siphon off of our any of our energy political or financial to stop co2 pollution well, I, you know, from our perspective, all aspects are important. Um, emission reduction is important. We can't just expect to, um, you know, work our way out of this problem with just looking at adaptation alone or emission reduction alone. Energy efficiency is a huge component of this. Renewables, the whole, the whole arsenal of things that we need to do to address this problem are important. And Congressman Inslee, I'm. My feeling is that the people who are on the ground experiencing the climate change that we're already having, the land managers, the coastal zone planners, um, they're the group that know it's happening, know the dangers uh, that climate change is creating. And we need to enlist their support in efforts to mitigate, and that mitigate is our first and best line of defense. But they can become allies in this effort, um, and it's not an either-or situation. And um, I, I believe that uh, we have, in fact, this, this attitude that you expressed has, in fact, kept, in fact, kept adaptation off of the agenda for about 10 years or more since Kyoto, um, to the detriment of these places that have experienced harms from climate variability. Um, having uh, had, had a heart attack, I can tell you that they can't actually cure them. They don't know the causes of all of them. Even if you follow their advice, you still have them. Mm -hmm. And you do treat the symptoms. Mm -hmm. And if you don't treat the symptoms, they get progressively worse. So right. you can't simply say, well, we're, we're not going to treat your symptoms until we know every cause of coronary artery disease. You treat the symptoms while you look. Well, we are doing that in my neck of the woods. King County, as you may have read in the GA reports, done some great work trying to respond to this problem. Uh, but I have, in talking to federal agencies, I have been impressed by the lack of sort of institutional uh, structure to make sure we do plan for the climate change that's already baked into the system. I was talking to someone in the Army Corps of Engineers whose responsibility is flood control, and I asked him, I, you know, do you have a specific change in hydrological cycles that you build into your planning process? And the answer was uncertain at best. What should we do to try to make sure federal agencies make this part of their regular planning process that hasn't been done? Um, we certainly think that it needs to be incorporated. And the first step is really for agencies to go back in and analyze where, what programs and activities they're responsible for where climate needs to be factored in and hasn't been up till now. So institutionally, how do we do that? I mean, do we have a climate change box they've got to check on, on every contract that they've looked at those numbers? I mean, how do we institutionally do it? I'm particularly thinking of the core at the moment, I guess. Yeah, you know, I, I think that this executive order that was uh, recently issued by the Secretary of the Department of Interior um, mandates this requirement throughout, the, throughout Interior. And I think that's an important first step, but clearly it needs to be followed up on, and it needs to be done not just in Interior, but in Department of Defense, as you suggested, and across um, many other agencies where climate impacts are going to be critical to the well-being of their programs and activities. Thank you. <clears throat> Great. Uh, gentleman's time has uh, expired. Um, and by the way, if the members want to ask additional questions, they can do so. What, what I've done, and, and, and perhaps, you know, members, I wish that, uh, <clears throat> I wish that uh, Congressman Cleaver was here because he actually gave me a tour of the Negro Baseball Hall of Fame that he actually uh, helped to establish out in Kansas City. Um, so what I decided to do is just to deal with this question. You already responded to it, Mr. Seidel. It's the, uh, it's the question of, uh, of where are we in the history of temperatures uh, uh, in terms of the planet and in terms of the United States. So I don't know if you can see this, but I've got a, a, a and I probably should put this in higher, in, 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 a, in a larger form, but this is a picture of the world and its temperature differences from the average 1880 to 2008. 
<clears throat> and you can see that the temperature um, just continues to rise as industrialization uh, really starts to hit in 1970, um, 1990, uh, uh, 1992, 2008. It, but for about a 10 year period, as you're saying, the, uh, uh, it's, it, there's a new normal, and the new normal is way up here. And you're right, it hasn't really spiked higher than the new normal, but it's very, very, very high. And so what I did was I asked them to compare that to the number of 40 home run hitters per season <laughs> in the Major League Baseball. And as you can see, it tracks very, very closely uh, to, um, to uh, the temperature uh, for the planet. Uh, except you get, as you do with a dramatic increase in CO2 in the atmosphere, as soon as steroids starts getting injected <laughs> into the system, the number of home run hitters uh, of 40 or more spikes dramatically, uh, beginning in about 1996, 1997, until testing for steroids begins about three years ago. And then there's a dramatic decline in the number of 40 home run hitters. Now, we have yet to have, as we know, um, an in, in interjection uh, of public policy to deal with CO2 in the atmosphere. So uh, the average temperature kind of mirrors the height of, uh, of 40 home run hitters did before we had uh, a new regime put in to test for artificial substances being put, kind of an anthropogenic uh, uh, impact on the number of 40 home run hitters. Um, but once it's taken out of the system, it's amazing how it returned to the norm that existed before, uh, before um, steroids were introduced. So I just, um, I just believe that, the, the, that uh, this artificial substance um, uh, correlation is almost undeniable. Uh, and, uh, and unless you want to believe, which I think Major League Baseball did, uh, that when people started hitting 72 and 75 home runs, that that was the new normal. And then we adjust to the new normal in the same way that people want to adjust to the new normal for temperatures. Well, it hasn't gone any higher. That's, that's okay. It's, it's leveled off. huh? And so why don't we just live with that? Kind of like saying to a kid, well, you've had a 102 degree temperature for the last uh, 10 days. That's, that's the new normal. Don't worry about 98.6, uh, Mrs. O'Brien, you know? Your boy will be okay. That's the new normal for Joey, huh? Well, it's hard for parents or baseball fans or fans of the planet to kind of get used to uh, having dramatic changes that are recurring that you're being told by uh, doctors are, are of the planet or uh, of individuals or of, uh, of baseball that, uh, uh, that there's nothing to worry about because that's the new normal. Uh, but then you begin to see uh, changes in the physiology of baseball players. And, and originally, and, and there can be contrary theories too. You can say, well, you know, maybe the bats are better. Maybe the ballparks are smaller. Maybe the baseball players are doing more weightlifting than they used to do, and you keep trying to find other reasons, but yet that new normal is so much higher than Babe Ruth or Hank Aaron or Willie Mays or Ted Williams that you kind of wonder, can they be that much better? Can, can it just be kind of, you know, uh, all these other circumstances and not the artificial substances going in? So, <clears throat> so it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of the rise of science here and as used by man mankind to uh, affect important systems. So I just thought I'd throw that in um, and uh, hope that maybe we could, you know, in Major League Baseball at its highest levels, was kind of in denial that, because they really loved all the fans that were coming into the ballpark to see these home runs. You know, it was almost like uh, using a baseball, bit to, uh, baseball bat to hit a golf ball It went so far. Uh, but it was normal, you know, all of a sudden. Uh, and then it stopped being normal again, and uh, we went back down. Uh, to um, the, uh, you know, the, the average that existed in 1964 or 1953, and that's what happened this year. You know, the home run leader only has like 39 home runs, 40 home runs. I wonder why. I wonder if uh, the bats aren't as good or the balls aren't as tied together as tight or the players aren't lifting weights as much. Okay? But I think most baseball fans kind of get it what went on. And that's what the polling kind of says about CO2. You know, they kind of get it. You know, they know that there's something going on that's being created by uh, man. So let me ask you this, Mr. Schwab. When you were looking at uh, 
um, Maryland, in the same way that we look at Massachusetts. And as you know, the, the uh, Supreme Court case of Massachusetts versus EPA was based upon the impact that CO2 had upon our coastline. Why did you look at the coastline? Do you have a feeling that that's the most serious danger to the State of Maryland and as a consequence perhaps to Massachusetts as well? Yes, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think there were probably two factors at play. One was that uh, heightened awareness of our threat, and I have spoken at all uh, already about some of the evidence of vulnerabilities in Maryland, um, obviously both on the Atlantic coast as yeah. well as uh, both both sides of Chesapeake Bay. Um, but in addition to that, I think it is important to note that while there was a heightened sense of awareness of that vulnerability, that our positioning to address this issue first um, was aided substantially by the availability of coastal zone, federal coastal zone management funding. So in fact, uh, when Governor O'Malley tasked the Climate Commission, um, we had 10 years' worth of data that had been support that had been gathered largely through the support of our coastal zo zone program and through federal funding that um, came in that way. Um, by way of contrast, some of the other areas that, are, that we have concern about um, that I mentioned that we were, will be dealing with in phase two impacts on uh, you know rainfall patterns, agriculture, some of the forest concerns um, were not areas where we had the uh, wealth of data um, so that we were positioned to make immediate changes. So phase two is now to, to spend the time, um, the energy and the money to get the data related to some of those other issue areas um, so that we can be better positioned uh, to make some, uh, to, to develop some action plans. Thank you, Mr. Schwab. Mr. Stevenson, in, in Mr. Schwab's written testimony, he mentioned that uh, three separate climate change adaptation strategies in the Chesapeake Bay region in the last year and a half uh, have been put in place. Um, from your experience with other complex environmental issues, do you have suggestions for the coordination efforts across Federal, State and local governments? Well, sp specifically, the, the overarching strategy is the starting point for, for pulling all, all that together. But um, what we noticed when we did our nationwide survey is that there is a, a huge lack of information out there about what is available. Um, there's a lot of climate change information, adaptation information, scientific information about what could happen, but there is no information clearinghouse as an example on where all that resides. We had trouble finding people out in the state and local governments that uh, were even aware of what was possible in adaptation, how to get started. So there is there's, um, a, a, an information need out there as well. How would you address, how would you, what, what recommendations would you make in terms of balancing the short term versus the long term uh, in dealing with um, climate change? Well, there just needs to be an organizational construct. I mean, there doesn't have to be a big bureaucracy to, to address Mr. Hall's concern, but uh, on the one hand, but, but right now all the agencies are sort of doing their own thing. There's not, there's not this um, integration across the government. There is not uh, good coordination from the Federal to the State and the local government. And that is the thinking that we think needs to go into this overarching strategy that hasn't happened yet. Um, Mr. Seidel, um, it is clear that we need more resources to support uh, site-specific uh, data so that policymakers can plan for the impacts of global warming. And we are never going to get uh, perfect information. Uh, how do we optimize our efforts uh, absent perfect information, which, of course, ultimately is unachievable? And in fact, you know, decisions now are being made on the basis of the one thing that we know is not true, and that is that the climate will not change. So any better information in terms of the direction the climate cha will change will improve those decisions. And I, I want to come back to just the costs that are involved here, because the costs of not adapting, the costs of not making land use decisions based on a changing climate, the costs of not designing bridges, intake valves for um, wastewater treatment plants, for water quality treatment plants, the costs of not doing that now is going to come back and really 
um, knock our society uh, for a loop down the road. So that's why it's critical that this starts um, sooner rather than later. Can you give me your numbers again for in terms of the ten hottest days in history, uh, ten hot, hottest years in history for the planet? Um, um, you know, I don't have those right off the top of my head, but no. I will get them. But, and you, put them on the you, record. but you said something like the the, the what last. I, what I said was that this last year um, was um, the coolest year of this century, mm -hmm. uh, but I believe was the tenth warmest year among the the record that dates back to the 1880s. And weren't the other nine in the, since 1998? I, I believe that's correct, yes. Yeah, and so you heard my correlation in terms of uh, years in which baseball players hit more than 40 home runs and the number of them. Do you, do you think that yes. there's any um, validity to the comparison I'm making with steroids and CO2? I, I, I think it's a wonderful um, analogy. Um, the one aspect of it that um, I w I'm concerned about is that when the players stopped taking steroids, mm -hmm. you had an immediate drop off. Unfortunately, one of the aspects of our climate system is that climate will continue to warm even once, if we were possible, to reduce CO2 emissions completely. So unfortunately, we're committed to the uh, not only the increase we've seen, but further increase, and not just for years, but for decades mm -hmm. um, and even centuries. Mm -hmm. um, uh, actually, that's actually very helpful, so it makes it even more urgent that we, because uh, the steroids in the planet system uh, don't wash out. They don't wash out. Uh, exactly. in, uh, in a six month period, it takes a lot longer to get it out of the system and to begin to return it to uh, some semblance of normality. Um, do you, uh, let me turn in again and recognize the gentleman from New York. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just uh, wanted to uh, ask one more question. Uh, um, first of all, uh, talk about the new normal for a second that you uh, mentioned. Uh, Orange County, uh, one of the five counties I represent, uh, has uh, some wonderful onion farmers who work the black dirt, as they call it, uh, uh, and they've been hit with repeated uh, storms that are uh, 350-year storms in the last five years. Um, there have been several days this year alone when there have been tornadoes in Orange County, New York, and, and other Hudson Valley counties. Not usually, the Hudson Valley is usually thought of as Tornado Alley. Uh, last year, Cedar Rapids, uh, Iowa, the, the city's slogan was the city that never floods, was under 12 feet, feet of water, I believe. Uh, 300 miles of the, of the uh, Mississippi River were closed to shipping because the water level, the flood level was higher than the locks and the mechanism had to be removed from the locks to keep permanent damage from being uh, done to them. Uh, the boring beetles in the uh, western the Rockies and Sierras have been moving forward and, uh, and drying out the trees by boring into them and uh, uh, satellite photographs or uh, aerial photographs show uh, brown swaths of uh, of uh, forest just waiting for a lightning strike to set off one of these um, increasingly common and disastrous wildfires. So the question is, uh, as far as this new normal is concerned, you know, how, A, how hard are we as a country or as a uh, society among other societies in the world willing to work to keep it from getting worse, to keep from the worst case scenario? And, and B, you know, how bad is that and how how should we be working to prepare for middle case or worst case? I don't think we can, that we can achieve the best case scenario based on what I've uh, seen so far. I spent a bunch of time last year at NOAA uh, in Boulder and at the NREL and NCAR uh, laboratories out there. And uh, the predictions of NOAA, uh, of the scientists, these aren't political people, they are scientists out there, uh, show uh, the growing latitudes for grain uh, and other crops moving north, and uh, and I said, well, that you know, are we in danger of becoming a net importer of food rather than a net, ex a net exporter of uh, food? And they said, yes, that's uh, that's possible. And uh, 
the problem is that the alluvial plain in Canada doesn't allow for soil depth to, if it gets, you know, if you push the, uh, uh, the growing latitude for uh, corn and soy and, and other grains, uh, wheat and so on far enough north, you run out of uh, uh, topsoil to do it on. Uh, so more than or as much as, uh, you know, coastal preservation or any of the other infrastructure and so on, adaptations that we uh, might uh, look at, I'm curious, uh, maybe, maybe starting with Mr. Stevenson, what you foresee in terms of uh, what we need to do to preserve our agricultural uh, productivity and the land and climate necessary to have it. Well, let me just say, on, you know, we're not a scientific organization, but um, the IPCC certainly assemb assemb uh, assembled the world's leading scientists in this area. And you're right, I think sea level rise is the most talked about and the probably best understood of climate change impacts. But I don't think we fully understand um, the effect on storms, the effect on uh, migration strategies, um, droughts. Um, and as all that, all, that, all that is crystallized, I think we will come up with different kinds of adaptation strategies for those. But I, I certainly don't have a silver bullet or, or a solution as to what we might do about that. Mr. Seidel, do you have a comment? On <coughs> Your mic, I think, needs to be. Sorry. Uh, in terms of the range of impacts that we face, I, you know, sea level rise does get a lot of the attention, but it just really depends on where you are. I mean, I think someone mentioned earlier melting of the permafrost um, in Alaska is critically important and something that's already being experienced. Um, droughts um, throughout the, the Southwest, I think, are, are critically important and certainly uh, are what these projections uh, would forecast. So I, it's, a, it's really a, a wide range of uh, issues um, and, um, you know, it is possible, though, to begin to plan for these now. I mean, making more efficient use of water makes sense. It makes sense yesterday. It makes sense tomorrow. It's going to make even more sense in the future. Um, and we really can't waste any time in getting um, better programs in place uh, to begin doing those things. Dr. Green, you look like you Thank had a comment. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> The two things I want to want to talk about is the science element. We've talked about a, a new normal. <clears throat> there is no such thing as a climate normal. We've got a, a climate that is billions of years old. It goes up and it goes down in temperatures. Climate is, in fact, an average of 30 years of weather. Each individual dot we would call a, a, a climate block. When you talk about climate, you're talking about 30 years of average weather. So 10 years, the fact that it's leveled off, I don't construe to mean things are changing direction. However, the models at a certain point don't allow for that to, ha to continue, and so it does cast doubt on the forecasting ability. But with regard to your specific question, again, water subsidies uh, and farm subsidies, uh, obstacles to the deployment and development of genetically modified crops, these are all things that the federal government can affect uh, that can make our agricultural base more resilient to climate variability, whether it's natural or, or, or um, anthropogenic. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Thank you uh, so much. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> the importance of this uh, hearing cannot be uh, overstated, and, and, and we thank you so much for uh, being here. Um, the, uh, you know, there's an old saying, sometimes you can be right, but too soon. So, you know, there's a lot of people just don't want to deal with the facts yet, and it can happen in, you know, a, a lot of things, including you know, uh, if a player on your team happens to jump from 20 home runs average to 50 all of a sudden, you don't want to ask too many questions, okay? And so, so it's, it's kind of a, 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 the same thing is true here, that uh, we, we have this uh, um, um, uh, conference that is going to occur in Copenhagen in uh, December. Uh, the world has basically accepted the science. Um, the National Academy of Sciences of every country in the world has signed off on the science. The world is waiting for the United States to be the leader and not the laggard. Um, the, 
The consequences are obviously greater in the shot run for developing countries around the world in terms of the uh, impact of global warming, but uh, inevitably, inexorably, it will hit us as well. And the Chesapeake Bay is a good example of uh, a warning uh, to us that uh, we're not immune and that adaptation will be very costly. Uh, and in some instances very difficult to uh, implement, but nonetheless we have to start thinking about it. Uh, that otherwise we would just be engaging in the kind of denial that ultimately create, turns the problem into something much worse. Um, a stitch in time saves nine, so I think it's important for us to have this hearing because the GAO report, and we thank you so much, Mr. Stevenson, for it will be a working document for the Select Committee on Global Warming as we make our recommendations to the speaker and to the administration and to the American people uh, and all of the rest of your testimony um, is very helpful to us, uh, <coughs> including yours, Mr. Green. So why don't we give everybody a one-minute summary of what it, uh, an opportunity to make a one-minute summary to us of what it is that you want us to keep in our minds six weeks out from Copenhagen as the world <laughs> gathers and what the implications are of the GAO report and the the testimony that we have heard today. So we'll give each one of you one minute to make your summary. We'll begin with you, Mr. Green. Which Thank under you. the under the under the Green uh, uh, formula actually turns out to be two minutes worth of written testimony delivered in one minute to <laughs> the committee. So, what, so thank you. I'll try not to rush through this. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think the key point I would raise for this is that. Uh, first of all, the technologies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the near term are very, very expensive and very limited. Unilateral action uh, by the United States would lead to serious economic disruption. Nonetheless, the fact that we know the climate is a variable system leads us, should lead us to take actions to make ourselves more resilient in the face of change, whether that change is natural or anthropogenic. Therefore, I would focus, <clears throat> I would suggest the refocusing of our attention on finding ways to make ourselves more resilient uh, at the federal and state level, and I think a great deal of that involves removing incentives we have currently in place that lead people to live in harm's way, in climatically fragile areas, in areas pr prone to drought, flood, fire, um, sea level rise, um, and saltwater intrusion. And if we address those things first, we would find the cost of adapting down the road to be considerably less than if we don't adapt, than if we don't address those things right up front. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Green. Mr. Seidel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I do hope you're going to enter your uh, your graphs into the official record. Uh, it, it will be entered. I mean, it, it has to be perfected. We, this won't come out of your time. I'm, I'm still working <laughs> on, you know, the com in, in completing the analogy, and I and I like the fact that I came up with the temperature for a children analogy as well in terms of a new <laughs> normal that the family has to adjust to. It's just too difficult for a doctor to figure out what's causing it, so we'll just accept the new normal. So I'm working on all of these analogies to deal with the preposterousness of saying that 10 of the, 10 of the, warmest, days in, 10 of the warmest years in history have occurred since 1998, but that's the new normal, and so just get used to it. And it won't go any higher than that ever again in the future. <laughs> it just doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. So your one minute begins now. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, I, I think <laughs> it's critical to look at adaptation policy as good economic policy, uh, and that these are costs that society is going to incur down the road. We heard about the San Francisco airport, the railroad lines in your district. I mean, if we don't begin uh, adjusting our thinking, adjusting the way we plan, taking the types of actions that Maryland has begun to take, um, the economic costs are going to be so severe down the road uh, that we will rue the day that we did not start adapting sooner. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Schwab. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me just first emphasize <coughs> some discussion about the con of adaptation versus mitigation. Uh, while we're focused here today on adaptation, the uh, concept of mitigation has also been prominent in Maryland. I wanted to emphasize that it's a, so a two-pronged approach. Uh, the second thing that I wanted to emphasize is, uh, again, the need for national coordination. And very specifically, um, that includes both federal coordination amongst the agencies as well as leadership uh, at the federal level, um, but coordination between the federal agencies and the state and local governments. So when we speak of national coordination, we speak 
implicitly about inclusion of the states and the local governments prominently in that discussion. Uh, I, we think it's absolutely imperative that government lead by example. Uh, we are doing that in Maryland. Uh, we see some of the federal agencies doing that already, uh, and we uh, just need to build on that and uh, get more strategic from a broader perspective. Uh, thank you, Mr. Schwab and Mr. Stevenson. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think uh, that our biggest contribution in our report is the survey that we did of uh, state and local officials. Those are the folks that are out there uh, on the front lines of trying to do adaptation planning. And so I would just reiterate what they pointed out to us, that the need for training and education to increase awareness. Um, they need more sp site-specific information. They need to know where to go to get that information, and they believe in clarifying roles and responsibilities. Um, we think that strategic planning is, is, is needed to better integrate the federal response to adaptation, and that's why we're recommending this, this need for a national framework or strategy in order to do that. Uh, we think CEQ and OSTP, who are leading those um, uh, efforts right now, are off to a good start. Um, and we'll be uh, watching anxiously to see how they proceed towards the development of that national strategy. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, sir. And uh, what we would like, if it would be possible, is for our staff to work with you in terms of what a national framework uh, should look like. Absolutely. Uh, so that we can uh, receive your uh, expert advice on what makes the most sense for doing that. And uh, we would appreciate that continued cooperation with us uh, moving forward. We'd be happy to do that. Thank you. And we thank each of our witnesses for um, your testimony today. We, uh, and with that, unless there are any other questions, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.